you're in the market for an airplane or even just thinking about it, I'm going to walk you through the whole process. There's a lot to know that really I wish I knew before shopping for my first airplane. So sit back, relax, and I hope you get a lot out of it. Hey, it's Steve from Clear Direct for the Pilot Network. Well, there's a lot to know, so I'm going to break each step down for you and share my lessons learned from my two times going through this process. We're going to scope this out. We're going to talk specifically shopping for pre-owned, certified, general aviation fixed wing aircraft. As always, each chapter is marked in the timeline if you need to skip around. Now, this content was informed by my two buying experiences and some research, but I don't claim to know everything. Please let me know in the comments if I can clarify anything or how your experience differed, but I hope it helps. So let's get into it. Let me start by saying that if you're not willing to put in some work in the way of research, communication, and maybe even travel, you may be better off going with a broker. I'll leave a link in the description to an article about brokers, but it's a bit biased since it was written by a broker. But if you're up for the challenge and want to save at least 5%, it can be pretty rewarding to take this challenge on yourself. The first place to start is to really understand your mission. How do you plan on using the airplane? Be honest with yourself. The main reason I've seen people buy an airplane is one, to build flight time and gain experience to work on more advanced ratings buying a bush plane for backcountry adventures and aerobatics and for business and leisure travel, which is the category that I'm in. So it'll be the focus of the rest of this mission chapter. If you're not quite there yet in convincing yourself or your significant other to pull the trigger and buy, I have this donut theory. Look at a map. Draw a ring around your home drone that delineates the range that you feel it's more convenient to drive a car to your destination versus fly yourself. Don't lie to yourself and make it too small. Remember, when dreaming about flying to your destination, you may need to rent a car when you get there. All right, next, draw the bigger ring, another ring, at the range where you feel it's more advantageous to fly the airlines. Now that you've defined your donut, ask yourself if your most frequent destinations fall inside that donut. If so, congrats, you've got a new way to justify this purchase. If your mission falls right on that outer ring, ask yourself, is there a direct airline service between these two locations? If not, I'd bump out that outer ring. In doing this exercise, you probably thought about the value of your time. Well, take it a step further. Put an actual dollar amount on your time. I'm not talking about your hourly wage or your salary. I'm talking about what you would pay to have more time in the day to play with your kids or visit your aging parents post-COVID or visit the Grand Canyon. This, this is meant to get you thinking about budget. Yeah, we're still in the mission discussion, but budget is a very important part of that. The cost of owning an airplane is very different than owning a car. I like to think about the costs in three categories. Initial costs, fixed costs, and hourly costs. The initial costs include down payment, loan fees, sales tax, travel, pre-purchase inspection, registration fees, and don't forget you may have to get a checkout in the make and model which will cost more than zero. The fixed costs are hangar tie down, insurance, and monthly payment. Annual inspection also fits into this fixed cost category even though the actual amount will vary year to year. It's fixed because it doesn't depend on flight hours unless you plan to fly that plane more than 100 hours a year. Hourly costs are fuel, oil, and the indirect cost of engine life. Engines need crazy expensive, I'm talking new car expensive overhauls every few thousand hours so you absolutely have to budget for that. The last thing I'll say on the budget topic is there's pretty much a direct relationship between cost and moving a lot of stuff through the air. And if you want to do it quickly, it becomes exponential very rapidly. Don't worry, there are some great options and great values out there, so stick with me. All right, let's talk about those two variables I just mentioned, useful load and speed. Not to insult your intelligence, but for the tow dippers or drivers by, useful load is pilot, passengers, baggage, and fuel weight. While the number of seats is important, useful load is even more important since very few four-seaters can actually carry four adults, baggage, and full fuel. But you may not need full fuel depending on the mission requirements. Now, the more I fly, the more I find that speed is not worth breaking the bank. Perhaps my perspective has been skewed flying fighters that 20 knots difference between types isn't that big of a deal, but I really don't think it is. You're already winning by flying over the traffic and going in straight shots. It's like Charmin says, enjoy the go. Now you can make up a lack of speed with better range eliminating fuel stops. So I contend that behind useful load, range nudges out speed on my 
priority list. So that's three things. The number four thing is avionics in the way of IFR, VFR equipment. Since I'm north of the 40th parallel, IMC usually spells ice and I avoid it like the plague. So I treat IFR equipment as nice to have. If it's a must for you and you operate in these northern latitudes, you may want to consider investing in an aircraft certified for a flight into known icing conditions or Fiki. But that spendy and TKS liquid will eat into your useful load. So you can tell this is a game of trade-offs. For me, my mission is to move four people with minimum baggage 250 miles two to four times a month. Three of these humans are small but growing pretty fast and I'd like to do the trip fairly quickly which takes a bit more fuel. Suffice to say, I need a useful load of at least a thousand pounds. There are a number of aircraft that do this mission really well. Take an honest look and, at your mission and try to quantify it like I did. Next up, educate yourself on what's required of an aircraft owner operator with respect to maintenance. For example, what's the difference between an advisory circular and an airworthiness directive? Is one required and another not? You've also got to arm yourself with some basic maintenance knowledge when shopping for an airplane to know how to read aircraft maintenance logs. Know how to spot a modification and the STC or lack thereof. If you don't want to know what I'm talking about, start off by reading Mike Bush's series of books, which are excellent and you can download now. I'll link them below and I'm not being paid to say that nor making any money off of the links. They're truly a great resource. While zeroing in on your target model and year or range of models and years, pay attention to the design, maintenance, sustainability, and flying characteristic quirks that you may want to avoid. Earlier model V-tail Bonanzas had a finicky fuel system that has bitten many pilots. Ask me how I know. You may find yourself avoiding this airplane because its reputation as a doctor killer, but when you look at the data, it suggests those structural issues have been fixed and it's a very safe airplane if you're aware of the few gotchas. Early Cessna 210s had an overly complicated gear retract mechanism. So learning about the aircraft is a matter of reading online articles, aircraft specific forums like Beach Talk or Mooney Space. If you've narrowed your search to a specific manufacturer, I'd recommend paying for a membership to the main society such as Cessna Pilots Association or American Bonanza Society. I pulled many juicy nuggets off of forums and society sites. Another place I'd recommend going is onto the FAA's website and search for airworthiness directives that could affect your favorite aircraft. You don't need to be an expert, just get familiar with the website and how to search and read ADs. For example, the VTL Bonanza has a few ADs that require wing spar webbing inspections as well as uh, some turnbuckle inspections in the right aileron, right? So this is important when you start going through a candidate's airplane maintenance logs. More on that later. Now, if you go to your local airport's FBO and start asking for opinions, take them with a grain of salt. We all have varying experience and ideas on our own mission. You know your mission best. Now, if your budget is unlimited, you're probably buying new or paying a broker and not watching this video. But if you're like me and have fiscal constraints, you'll have to concede and go with a model that has maybe some known issues you'll have to work around. Which brings me to my next major point. Find a mechanic with knowledge of your chosen aircraft type that's willing to take you on before you buy. You should be open to allowing this to influence which make and model you buy because it can really make or break your aircraft ownership experience. This was pretty miserable for me on my first airplane, I'll be honest, and I learned the hard way. You don't need to have your favorite chosen mechanic on your airfield, but you should have a mechanic on your airfield to help you with minor issues to get you airborne so you can fly to your guy or gal. If you're interested in learning more about your airplane and doing an owner-assisted annual inspection, ask your mechanic if they're open, open to that. Mine's not, which was a little disappointed, but he explained to me why and made some good points. It's not to say you can't do anything yourself. It's pretty rewarding and can save some money to learn to change your oil yourself, get your hands and elbows dirty. If you're borrowing money to make this happen, the next step is to find a lender and get pre-approved. Now look into learning about the lender's financing terms. This is a foot stomper. Check it out. I was fat, dumb, and happy looking for a late 60s, early 70s model Bonanza um, when I floated a pricey, sexy looking late 70s model by him and he told me my monthly payment would actually decrease because it was newer than 1974 which allowed my 15 year loan to become a 20 year term and my rate dropped by a tenth of a percent. So obviously proceed with caution since now I started salivating over more expensive aircraft. Stick to your budget. If you're budgeting by monthly payment, then hell, go for it. 
Think about where you're gonna park at the aircraft. Tie down outside, rent a hangar, buy a hangar. The only advice I'll give you is if you can afford a hangar, do it. But heads up, a lot of airports have waiting lists for hangars, years long, and it's the reason why I'm sitting out on the ramp freezing my ass off talking to you. Being out on the ramp also really limits my flying in the winter for obvious reasons, but an another not so obvious reason on a beautiful day like today is I don't start my airplane when it's below 45 degrees. I don't have a way to preheat it. If you buy a hangar, don't forget to budget for utilities, property taxes, and monthly airport ground lease. It's not the end of the world if you don't get a hangar. Don't let that stop you. But the colder or wetter the climate, the more I try to get a hangar. Fortunately, I should be in a hangar by summer, knock on wood. Okay, next, insurance. Call an aircraft broker and get a few quotes. If, if you have a few makes, models, and years you're mulling over, an insurance quote can really help you decide. Some companies won't even insure you until you have a few hours in that type, especially high performance and complex models. Having a good insurance company was invaluable after my crash. They didn't add to my already high stress and paid out quickly regardless of fault. We didn't know yet, NTSB is still investigating. That said, finding a company to insure me after my loss, regardless of loss, was nearly impossible. Luckily, I found one. Now that you've settled on a few makes, models, and years comes the fun part, the hunt. Don't be in a rush. An airplane transaction has a lot of steps that take varying amounts of time, so don't, don't rush it. If you're in a rush, consider using a broker. Don't expect to find an airplane that suits your needs in your local area. Expect to have to travel to go see it and fly it. The online airplane marketplaces I've searched the most are Trade-A-Plane, Controller, and Barnstormers. The other places to really focus your search are the forums. I found both of my airplanes in the for sale listings on Beach Talk. It's free and convenient to the seller with lots of eager eyes, so a lot of the time you'll see a lot of great listings here that never make their way to commercial listing websites. Be prepared that your budget probably won't buy you everything you want. If it does, beware of the damage history or high time motor or corrosion. So let's talk about each of these. First, damage history can be okay if the airplane was fixed professionally and has demonstrated a lot of issue-free flying since the damage. A common one is a gear up landing and a retract. I'm not too concerned about it if the repair shop is reputable and it occurred a while ago. I won't define that, but look for, I don't know, at least a few years and a few hundred hours. Look at old damage that was well repaired a long time ago as an opportunity since it could help bring down your purchase price of the plane. Watch out for prop strikes and also corrosion repairs. Next, engine time. This is a complicated one that uh, that's, I'm gonna summarize by saying most of the aircraft's value is tied to how much time the engine or engines have left. This is why you might find some seemingly affordable twins. Now there's a differing opinions on the value of sticking to an engine's manufacturer's recommended TBO, time between overhaul, but everyone agrees that engines' lifespans are not infinite. Many engines have a TBO of 1,500 or 1,700 hours, and an overhaul costs between $20,000 for smaller engines and $40,000 for bigger six cylinders. But listen, most people get 20 plus years out of an engine. Now, Continental engines typically need top overhauls at some point. Lycoming's not so much. A top overhaul is pretty much what it sounds like, an overhaul of the components outside of the crankcase. So the cylinders are jugs, the valves, etc. Okay, that was super quick, but I wanna move on to the last major thing to watch out for, which is corrosion. Before putting eyes on an aircraft, there are two main clues that can tip you off that an aircraft is at higher risk of corrosion. One, a lack of recent flying puts an engine at risk of corrosion since the innards aren't getting lubricated frequently. And two, where has the aircraft spent a lot of its life? Obviously, more humid and salty environments are more likely to cause corrosion than arid. But that's no reason to avoid a shopping for a nice Florida flyer. You'll want to put eyes on it, and more importantly, trained eyes of a mechanic in a pre-buy inspection. Avionics are another huge driver of aircraft cost. Get familiar with what some of the avionics are that people list. Heads up, people will list this piece of junk as an asset in the laundry list of trash in their airplane. If you've done some research on how much avionics cost, in the case of thinking of upgrading, double that cost. The labor rates are insane. Plus, inevitably, they'll find bad wiring or a bad antenna that needs replaced. Now that said, breathing new avionics life into a classic airplane, if you can afford it, can be a lot of fun. For me, I'd rather buy the plane with the avionics I want already installed and let the previous owner eat the exorbitant installation fees. 
The avionics I value most are, personally, are an engine monitor and strong radios. A little lower on the list are an autopilot and ADI. Notice I didn't say GPS. Again, I treat IFR as a contingency, so this means my iPad is A-OK -okay for 99% of my flying. I just want a good ADI to keep my right side up if I inadvertently fly into a cloud or need to fly at night. The last thing I look for is an ADS-B out transponder. I look at ADS-B in as nice to have since there's a lot of cheap and easy ways to receive data. This one's pretty ugly, but hey, I built it myself for like 50 bucks. Okay, so your mouth is watering and you're ready to contact a few sellers. I make a Google spreadsheet, which I'll share with you to keep your candidates organized. When you're all organized, start with your favorite aircraft and ensure you have the right mindset, which is what's wrong with this airplane and why does it appear that I can afford it? Do not get your hopes up to the point of overlooking major issues. If you don't find any at a glance, be a sleuth and find what's wrong. It's not to say that you won't get around it. The two most common reasons I find airplanes that appear to be good deals are that the plane hasn't flown or has some damage history. Those things aren't immediately obvious from listings. Contact the seller via email or phone and first ask if the plane is still available. If it is, start by asking some basic questions to fill in your spreadsheet. If things are still looking pretty good and you haven't found the disqualifier yet, now is the time to do a logbook review. Request to see the logbooks, and if the seller has their act together, they'll be hung on a website or they'll email you a link to the files on their Dropbox or Google Drive. Less savvy sellers will just email you a megabytes of, of huge files, so that's okay. If the seller acts put out by this request, run the other way. They're hiding something or not motivated to sell their plane. This is just a common practice of selling an airplane. Minimally, there are three books maintained with every aircraft, an airframe, engine, and propeller log. I always start at the end of the engine logbook and look at the latest entry. Most likely, it's the annual inspection. I look to see if the cylinder compressions are above 70 and see what discrepancies were fixed. I also see what ADs were referenced and complied with. This is huge and will potentially expose big issues. On one airplane, I was really hopeful about the mechanic wrote that ADXYZ was complied with and the next inspection was due in 50 hours. Hmm, what's driving an inspection less frequently than 100 hours? So I opened up the AD on the FAA's website and saw that this particular manufacturer's cylinder had cracking issues which drove that 50 hour inspection. But I looked even closer and saw that the cylinders were required to be replaced after 12 years in service. Back to the logbook, I found that the cylinders were installed at overhaul 23 years ago. That can't be right. Was the airplane flying illegally? Hang on, hang on. You probably don't know something here. So I did a little bit more digging and learned that the AOPA applied for an alternative method of compliance, or AMOC, and successfully got a few more years out of these cylinders. But they still had to be replaced after 19 years. So yeah, this airplane had been flying out of compliance with an AD for four years. I half expected the seller to just not reply to my email pointing this out, but he was thankful and embarrassed. Now, this isn't very common, luckily, since I've found mechanics to be pretty damn on top of ADs. Now, other things to look at in the engine log. Ensure annual or 100-hour inspections have been accomplished regularly, and note how much flying has occurred between each via the tachometer note. I like to see, at the very least, 30 hours a year. Okay, over the airframe logbook. I'm primarily looking for corrosion and damage repair. I like to see rubber items swapped out recently, such as gap seals, door seals, and fuel cells, unless the plane has wet wings. I also like to see occasional landing gear rigging, flap motor and landing gear motor overhauls, but those aren't vital. The next thing I look for is proper documentation of modifications. A typical one for early model Bonanza, for example, is the baggage compartment, they wanted it to look like a newer one and extend it a little bit, despite the center of gravity issues. My first Bonanza had this done, and there was no record of it in the paperwork. So the next step, pull the aircraft records from the FAA to see if it's there. I would absolutely recommend doing this once you're in escrow on any airplane. It costs only $10 and is great peace of mind. In fact, my escrow title company um, did it for me. Now back to my last Bonanza. It didn't have the modification form 337 filed with the FAA. I didn't catch it in pre-buy. So at my first annual, my mechanic wouldn't even touch the airplane. What a freaking nightmare. So I had to fly my Bonanza from Oregon to Kansas City uh, just to have find a mechanic that would look at it. Anyway, can you tell I like to learn things the hard way? This is why I'm sharing this stuff with you. All right, the logbooks 
look pretty good and you're ready to make an offer. Technique only here, I try not to make an offer before I see the airplane and ideally fly the airplane. But sometimes that's just not possible. So let's assume the airplane is far away and you'd like to make an offer first and add contingencies. So let's talk about the price first. How do you know what to offer? There's no Kelly Blue Book for aircraft, right? Well, actually there kind of is. It's called VREF and you can get a detailed valuation on any airplane. Now, VREF has sponsored previous episodes, but I didn't want them to sponsor this one, but, so there's no conflict of interest here. VREF has been a great tool for me, no kidding, to keep me from making a big mistake. I always start when I offer at the VREF value and really don't move much from there. Let the seller come down to meet you. Be ready to walk and lose the airplane. I've lost many and tell myself that, hey, I'll let others pay too much. This comes down once again to patience and mitigating hopes. Email your offer to the seller and add the following statement. Contingent upon further document review, test flight, and pre-purchase inspection. An email offer is not legally binding, but I like to add that just to manage the seller's expectations. Don't forget to budget for sales tax if you live in a state with sales tax. It can get a little tricky with the tax man when considering where delivery takes place. I'll link an article below for more information on that. Suffice to say, I bought my first airplane in California, sales tax, and flew it and kept it in Oregon. Didn't know sales tax. Uh, anyway, after haggling over the price, hopefully you come to an agreement, and once you do, you'll make things official by writing and signing a purchase agreement. Be careful about signing a seller's broker agreement, as they're typically stacked in the seller's favor, as you would expect. Feel free to engage with the broker to see if they'll change the troubling language. If it's just you and the private party seller, offer to write it up. I'll link a template below. Sweet! Okay, now you can get a little more excited, but shift your mindset now to what are we gonna find that's gonna make me walk? Unless you're buying with cash, call your lender and begin that process. They'll have some hoops for you to jump through even if you're planning on doing your own pre-buy. Check out my series on that topic, by the way. Um, chances are your lender will make you have an AMP sign off on certain things. My lender also required that it was a different mechanic than signed off on the last annual. Start calling around and getting on somebody's schedule. A full pre-purchase inspection can cost upwards of $1,000, but think of it as an insurance policy. One opportunity is that if the plane's annual is coming due or if it's overdue, offer to split that annual with the seller, which will satisfy your pre-purchase inspection and now you got a fresh annual. The long pull in the tent is getting on that mechanic's schedule. If you haven't seen or flown the plane yet, make a plan to do that. On the day of the closing, there shouldn't be really anything left to figure out, just ensuring money flows and keys and logs get exchanged. Don't forget the log books. If you can manage it, try not to fly with those log books in case something tragic happens. Check the weather and notams and fly your awesome new to you aerospace conveyance to its new home. After you make all your proud social media posts, register your plane with the FAA and your state aviation authority. You guessed it, they're linked below. And that's it folks, that's all there is to it. As always, I love hearing from you and read all your comments, so please let me know how your experience went or if you have any questions.